Thank you, Mark. I invite you to open your Bible to Psalm 98. Psalm 98. A psalm. O sing to Yahweh a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, and with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together. Before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. So reads the word of the living God. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your word. And now we ask that You would, in this holy moment, do what only Your Spirit can do. And that is mix the effects of your word, your perfect, infallible, holy, powerful word with the sovereign working of your spirit. We ask this to be accomplished for your name's sake so that you would get all the glory and that we would be the beneficiaries of that mingling of word and spirit. So in this time, Father, would you be our teacher, instructing us and challenging us and encouraging us. You know what the souls that you created need. So be with us, God, in this time. Instruct us from your wonderful word. In Jesus' matchless name, amen. I shot a deer the other day. Just have to start with that. Didn't feel like it was the right place to say it, but just I had to say it publicly. God made deers to be delicious. Mr. Kent told me not to pluralize deer, but I just do that because you have to understand what a, what a novice I am. I'd never hunted a mammal before. I grew up fishing with my dad, and I, I'd hunted birds before, pheasants and ducks and things, but... I'd never gone after a mammal until this weekend. And so I just need to publicly apologize for killing one of Ford's prized deers. <laughs> so that was the main thing. Now my son Owen is with me and we're always grateful to be out here. We've had a few trips this year uh, to get to know the folks at this church and it's always a pleasure. Uh, we came out with the whole family this summer and y'all were so kind and hospitable and, and we, we very much love this place. and are grateful for the opportunity to come and help and minister in any way we can. And this morning, the way I'd like to, to minister to you is through Psalm 98. The title of this message is Joy to the World. And lately I've been thinking about Christmas songs, and by lately I mean since October when my wife starts to play Christmas music in the car. And I've been thinking about both the the meager Christmas songs that talk about more the sentimental or cultural aspects of Christmas, be that Santa Claus stuff or, or reindeer stuff. And I've also been thinking about some of the more profound songs, like the ones we sang this morning, that have to them a theological depth that's really quite remarkable. And so as I've been thinking about these songs and, and researching them a bit, I wanted to bring one of these songs to you, and I'm not going to preach a song to you. Uh, Joy to the World, though, is, is the basis for, uh, or Psalm 98 is the basis for, for the song, Joy to the World. And what I'd like to do this morning is introduce you to that song, a song that I'm sure you'll hear over the next week many times on the radio, and, 
uh, in years to come. Joy to the World is one of the most famous and uh, played and enjoyed Christmas hymns that there is. Uh, but it's remarkable to me because Joy to the World isn't like most Christmas songs that the church sings rooted in the birth narrative of Jesus. It doesn't come from Luke chapter 2. It's not about Philippians 2, Jesus' incarnation or humiliation. Instead of looking at a manger scene or, or angels or the wise men or one of those most typical Christmas scenes, it draws its inspiration in its boisterous praise of God from an ancient song older than itself. It was written by a man named Isaac Watts. And if you know anything about hymns, you know Isaac Watts. He was the Babe Ruth of the, the hymnal. I thought that was funnier than you guys did. <laughs> but Isaac Watts is uh, well known for his contributions to English hymnody. He was born in 1674. Uh, he had a preternatural gift as a poet, even as a little kid. He would have been, today he would have become a rapper. But uh, back then, it was by his, uh, his father was a very strict man. Uh, it wasn't necessarily encouraged. Uh, he was once caught looking up during uh, the family meal prayer with his eyes open. And he was chastised by his father. And he answered his father in that moment when he's asking him why his eyes were open in such irreverence during the prayer. He said, Little Isaac Watts as a child, a little mouse for want of stairs ran up a rope to say its prayers. He was gifted. He got in trouble for saying that to his dad, too. <laughs> and after some corporal punishment, he said, Oh, Father, Father, pity take, and I will no more verses make. So he was a gifted guy. He grew up to be a writer, a logician, a school teacher, a theologian. Uh, a hymnologist and a minister. He wrote such famous songs as When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. And this song, the title of our message, Joy to the World. And just to refresh your memory of what this Christmas song has in it, listen to its words. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. The final verse of it, He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and the wonders of His love. It's those three verses that are most commonly sung by those who have recorded this song or sung this song, and it has been recorded and sung by so many artists, it's so well known, the most published Christmas song of all. Usually the third verse is skipped. I skipped it when I read it to you. Listen to what it says. You can see why maybe it isn't as popular among the Christmas crowd normally. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. I mean, that one just doesn't go with shopping at the mall that good. It's got too much sin and sorrow and curse in it. But for Isaac Watts, this whole verse, all this poetry, was inspired by an older poem, by an older song. Uh, the psalm we read this morning, Psalm 98. The author of this song is unknown. The rabbis looked at Psalm 98 and they called it an orphan psalm because it has such a strange and simple title to it. See there at the very top, next to the number 98, it says a psalm. That's a very unusual inscription in the Psalter. You have 150 of these things and they're introduced various ways, but there's only two that begin with the phrase a psalm. And so the rabbis called it an orphan song and Isaac Watts picked up on this song and found in it such inspiration about the coming of Christ. A psalm that doesn't mention Jesus at all, but instead speaks of worshiping God, the covenant God of Israel, and the salvation He has worked, and then speaks in a musical kind of terms in the middle of the song, and then ends with this 
very naturalistic look at the world being judged. And, and by the world, he's talking not just about the inhabitants of the world, but all the ordinary stuff of the world. He's talking about hills and rivers and seas. So it's a very interesting song to become a Christmas song. But Johnny Cash liked it, and Whitney Houston liked it, and Faith Hill liked it, and Mariah Carey liked it, all except the third verse. And even the cursed pentatonics have sung Boy to the Wor Joy to the Wor Boy to the World, funny. It's, it's an interesting song, and what fascinates me is its connection to this song and how seemingly unchristmassy it is. No mention of his first advent, no mention of a baby in a manger. This is a song that we always associate with Christmas, but it's a song with a, a wider perspective. It's thinking about not primarily the focus on Christ's first coming, but it thinks about Christ's first coming in light of the ultimate purpose of God in, in bringing Christ a second time. This is a song about the second coming of Jesus. And Psalm 98, likewise, is a song that is focused on worship in this world being a prelude to worship in the world to come. And so that's where the, the continuity between these two songs come from. This Christmas hymn, Joy to the World, has such rich theology in it because it derives that theology from this ancient song that Israelites sang 3,000 years ago in anticipation of their worship being exponentially greater in a time to come. The unique focus of Psalm 98 on the judgment of God at the end, of the, of the remaking of the natural world, of the melodious parts of instruments and song in the middle section, and with this very dense theological focus at the beginning section has caused this song to be beloved by, by preachers and writers and, and hymnists. Uh, some have looked at this song, uh, or this Psalm 98. Uh, for example, John Stott, he divides it this way. You can see most of your translations divided into three parts. John Stott looked at it with uh, this posture, God is Savior, verses 1 through 3, God is King, verses 4 through 6, and God is Judge, verses 7 through 9. And I, I think that's a helpful way to think about it. Uh, others have looked at it with a focus on Israel in verses 1 through 3, the nations in the middle section, and the natural world at the end. But neither of those divisions work for me because I see all of those truths coming out in all of those, those sections, the stanzas. And as we approach Psalm 98, and I'm just trying to kind of get you to look around it before we dive into it and think about why this is such an appropriate song for us to think about at Christmas time and, and really what the substance and basis of this song is, I want you to see what the meaning of Psalm 98 is. Because Psalm 98 really does instruct us about how to worship God in a way that pleases Him. <laughs> why we should think about our worship, not just in terms of Sunday to Sunday, but that Sunday is in fact a, a prelude to the world to come. And that the promise and joys and expectations of Christmas are actually a foretaste of the ultimate aim of God in making all things new. In other words, it's easy for everybody, Christian or, or non-Christian alike in our culture, to enjoy Christmas, twinkling lights and I saw a, a, a horse-driven carriage going through to look at lights last night in the neighborhood here, and, and everybody can get behind that. Even the story of a baby in a manger seems somewhat approachable, but we have to understand that the chief aim that God accomplished in sending His Son to take on flesh in this world wasn't in an ultimate sense for His Son to die for our sins. That was certainly God's intention. But in an ultimate sense, God's aim, God's desire, was that through His death, Jesus would be ultimately glorified and this world would be set right. And so what we're talking about is we're talking about a, a kind of thinking about Christmas 
that looks not just at the coming of Jesus as an infant, but at his ultimate victory over uh, sin and death and his renewal of this entire world. And so the perspective of Psalm 98 is a, a massive perspective. And that's what I want you to wrap your minds around. The unique focus of this song in light of Jesus' second advent, his second coming, not a baby in a manger, but the royal reign being grounded in an Old Testament song, this ancient Hebrew poetry that has a concern about the Messiah finally coming. This song has been known as the Cante Domino. It's, it's the Latin phrase for the first words, O sing to the Lord. And it's a song that has a, a significant, Psalm 98, when I talk about the song, it has a significant use in the church. In the Book of Common Prayer in the Church of England, this psalm, Psalm 98, was read between the Old Testament reading and the New Testament fulfillment. This has always been seen as a song that so appropriately builds a bridge from then to now, that looks from ancient to future. And that's what this does. And I'd love to inform our perspective this morning as believers as we start to prepare for Christmas and gather and, and get presents and uh, enjoy one another's company and, and go hunting and all the things you do at Christmas time, uh, that we would be mindful that there's something radiant, something glorious, something so far in front of Christmas, that first advent, that makes us have this longing and this yearning for Christ's second coming really the purpose of his first coming. So, so all that is, is kind of a, an intro to set us up with Psalm 98. One author says it this way, what's remarkable about this song, Psalm 98, is, is the way in which it is fixed solely on the Lord and his victory. There's no mention of defeated enemies and no mention of the gods of other peoples as in Psalm 96 or 97. They've all faded into the background. In Psalm 98, the Lord alone holds center stage. His victory is celebrated with the unrestrained, joyful acclamation appropriate for a king to the accompaniment of a royal fanfare. That's what gets me excited about Psalm 98. Is it really is a coronation song. And that's what we need to be about all year round, but especially at Christmas time. It's wholly given up to praise. It's wholly given up to praise. So let's, let's listen to it. Let's follow its exuberant example. Let's not forget that he is the infant who came in a manger, but he had a greater purpose, even in his dying, in his resurrection, that points towards his ultimate victory. That's why this song is so beautiful. I want to look at it in three parts. It's a song about worship. It's a song that worships, that describes worship, that, that is worshiping. It's a song that gives us occasion to worship. I think it's the perfect psalm to set us up for Christmas. So Psalm 98 does this so well. It gives us an occasion to worship. The God who came and the God who is coming again. Jesus' humble incarnation, his life of praise to God, and his worship of God is prefigured in Psalm 98. And Psalm 98 teaches us that the ultimate fulfillment of all our worship is really in the life to come. And it gives us something worth waiting for, something worth living for. So, so let's look at it in, in three, I think, simple parts that divides quite naturally, so quite easily. Uh, first, the motive of praise, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll look at the melody of praise in verses 4 through 6, and the mission of our praise in verses 7 through 9. Well, let's begin by thinking about the motive of praise, the motive of praise. It begins with those words, O oh, sing to the Lord. Lord, all in caps in your Bible, reminds us it's the covenant name of God from Ezekiel 34, uh, God who says, I am Yahweh his personal name given to his people. 
And this song, like so many songs in the Hebrew Psalter, begins by singing to God, and he uses the phrase, a new song, a new song. Well, we already begin to see the motive of praise in this song in the direction that this song sets itself on. See, our worship to God is first and foremost for Him. It's the audience of one concept. It's that when we sing and when we serve and when we study and when we fellowship, and worship isn't just singing, you know that, but when we act in reverence to God, our direction is unto God. Sing to the Lord. Sing to Yahweh. And then he says a new song. I don't think it's just an original composition that he has in his mind, though you're welcome to write a new song. There might be some potential Isaac Watts in here. Uh, but the idea of a new song is probably the same idea that Jeremiah uses in chapter 3 when he says the Lord's mercies are new every morning. It's not that the mercies tomorrow morning are different. It's that it's a fresh experience of God's mercy, a fresh experience of God's grace. And so a call for a new song isn't necessarily just a call for an original composition. It's a call to sing anew, to sing a fresh song, to meditate on freshly discovered truth, to be mindful of new experiences of God's working in our lives and in uh, redemption past. Just as His mercies are new every morning, our song should be new each day. And our worship should be Godward. It's a good reminder to religious people that we need to make sure that our religiosity is always unto God. It's always theocentric. It's always mindful that this is about Him, not about the things we do, not about what we want, but it is directed towards Him. So we say with the psalmist, sing to the Lord, sing to Yahweh a new song. And the motive for the praise is given here. And maybe you could list them out as six different motives in these three verses. I'll just rattle them off for you. Reason number one, He's done wonderful things. Reason number two, He has worked salvation for Him. Reason number three, Yahweh has made known His salvation in verse 2. Again, in verse 2, a fourth motive is He has revealed His righteousness. Uh, Verse 3, a fifth motive, He has remembered His loyal love and His truth. And then a sixth motive, for the house of Israel, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And so we're seeing this Godward focus in the worship, that the motive of our worship needs to be always motivated and directed towards God, but we're also seeing that our worship needs to be content-driven. And this is a challenge to contemporary Christians who often lead first with emotion and preference when they think about worship. In other words, I don't like drums in my worship, or I really like only the old hymns, or I like you know Hillsong jams, or, or whatever, People have preferences in how they they want to pursue worship when it comes to music, and they're they're rarely first thinking about what is it saying. What what you notice in, in a song like this one, an inspired song, a divinely authored song, a song that God's people have been singing in Israel past and, and Christians for centuries, is that biblical worship is, is content driven. It's propositional. There's there's truth here. There's stuff that we know about God to be true. That's why Christianity is such an important propositionally focused uh, religion. It has truths about God that you don't get to decide if you like them or not. Your worship can't be emotionally driven before it's been grounded and founded in truth in doctrine, in theology. And so the psalmist isn't just talking about how he feels first and foremost, he's talking about what he knows. And that's important for feely people. I'm a feely person. I sometimes have the emotional constitution of a a 14-year-old girl. In the hunting blind the other day, I was shaken like a leaf. And no offense to 14-year-old girls. And, and, And I mean, that's all of us though. I mean, how you feel, it depends day to day on what you had for breakfast and if your blood sugar's off, if you're having a good day, if you're having a good week, if you're happy, sad. I mean, if you start your approach to worship with, Here, here's where I'm at, it's the wrong starting point. Go someplace more stable with that. 
begin with who is God? Well, what does he say about himself? What has he accomplished? This is the necessary thoughtfulness that goes into true God-centered worship. We are about him, and he has told us what he is like. And so I love that this psalmist is so, he's got so much dense truth. He speaks of the marvelous things God has done in, in verse 1. And I think it's a, a wide kind of phrase, the, the word marvelous things. It's the Old Testament word for miracles. And when we think of miracles, we think of hokey stuff on TV, people getting knocked down, you know, weird stuff like that. That's not the Old Testament word for miracles. The Old Testament word for miracles speaks of judgment and rescue. Whenever you see a miracle in the Old Testament, it's either a, a, an act of God's judgment on a people, think of the ten plagues, or it's an act of deliverance, think of the Exodus. Those are the miraculous acts of God. And so this psalmist thinks of those things, God's intervention in human history, as one of the motives for worship. And then he talks about the mightiness of God, his right hand. Uh, the right-handed people uh, understand that they, they don't want to use their left hand. And southpaws, likewise, better baseball players, tricky business. But whatever your strong hand is in most of the world, it's the right hand. And so the biblical expression, his right hand, speaks of God's strength, God's might, God's power. His right hand and his holy arm. It's all talking about the things that God has done. And so how do, we, how do we worship God? Well, in a content sense, we worship Him for who He is and what He's done. And the psalmist is thinking about what God has done. And I think this is kind of an umbrella phrase over the whole song because look where he goes next. He has worked salvation for Him. Three times in the first three verses, he uses this word salvation. Maybe your Bible translates it victory or deliverance. They're synonymous terms. He has worked salvation in verse 1. Yahweh has made known His salvation or victory in verse 2. And at the end of verse 3, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation or victory of our God. God's salvation, God's victory, God's deliverance is the theme of this song. The wonderful things He's done thinks of all that God has done in His strength in the past. And now this interchangeable word of victory, salvation, deliverance. And I think that's even helpful because salvation is such a spiritualized word to us. We think of salvation primarily on a soul level. You know, God has saved me from my sins because of Jesus' death on the cross. I have the hope of, of life to come in heaven because Jesus was raised from the, the grave. And because I've placed my faith in Him, I'm saved. I've experienced salvation. Well, victory is a synonymous word in the Old Testament for salvation, and rightly so. When a people was rescued, or when an army was, was uh, strengthened by the Lord and overcame their enemies, they would use that same word translated with these different English words directly. The, the concept is intentionally overlapping. When you are saved, you have experienced the victory of Christ. And when you are saved, you've experienced full deliverance, transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light. And so this concept can be a very ordinary concept, like your life was preserved, you were rescued from death. It can be a very spiritual concept, my, my soul has been redeemed, and that's the psalmist's song. He's talking about God's work, God's salvation, God's victory, and God's deliverance. I, I love the, the content, just keeps rolling in, and we could spend a lot of time on these first three verses, but uh, we've, we've got to make progress here. Verse 2, Yahweh has made known His salvation in the sight of the nations. He has revealed His righteousness. He's remembered His loyal love and His truth. You know, we, we talked about the needful direction of our worship being Godward, but you also realize there is a horizontal dimension of worship. Consider with me the pronouns of verses 1 through 3. For He has done wonderful things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. Yahweh has made known His salvation, verse 2, in the sight of the nations. He has revealed His righteousness, verse 3. He has remembered His loyal love and His truth. For all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. These pronouns all remind us that though initially the song is being sung to Yahweh, He's speaking, the singer is speaking about God as well. 
It's a vital aspect of our worship, and really one of the motivations of worship is not just to praise God directly, but to know that we have a responsibility to other believers, that when we gather, when we sing, when we uh, sit under the teaching of the Word, we do this with the goal of edifying one another. And that's why so many of our, our songs that we sing ought to be sung directly to God, but we should also, like the Psalms show us, have songs that we sing about God. And that's why Ephesians tells us that we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another, making melody in our hearts. So it's right to sing to each other. It's right to to talk about who God is and what God has done. That's intended to be a great encouragement for us when we gather and we hear other brothers and sisters singing this truth. It's intended to wash over us and remind us what God has done, remind us who God is, especially songs of salvation and victory and deliverance. And so this psalmist just keeps giving us motives. He's telling us that worship is Godward, that worship is intentionally congregational. In other words, we talk about God to one another, and that, and that our worship is intended to be doctrinal and even theological. Verse 3 says, he has remembered his loyal love and his truth. These are the two most commonly used attributes of God in all the Psalms. Holiness is the predominant attribute of God in the Old Testament. But in the Psalms, what God's people sing about more than anything else are those two things. His hesed, His loyal love, His committed love, and His echud, His his faithfulness, His truthfulness. Psalm 89 is a whole song just about God's ability and willingness to keep all His promises. That's His faithfulness. God's loyal love is one of his leading attributes. Well, what's the larger point here? The larger point is that our worship needs to be informed in, in who God is. And, and simply, that's theology. Theology isn't some egghead thing for seminarians. Theology is, is vital because it tells us who God is. And everybody's got theology. It, it's not necessarily biblical. But everybody's got a concept of God. I've heard lots of people say something. I remember this one kid, uh, we'll call him Jeff. His name was Jeff. Uh, (laughs) And he told me, well, I think think God is like my grandfather, you know. And he told me about a painting that his grandfather had in his bedroom. And it was some kind of mamby-pamby, you know, grandfatherly figure. And he thought God was like that. Well, that's fine, Jeff, but you didn't write the Bible. You don't get to pick what you think God might be like. And that's why theology is so important. When it comes to worship, that's why we are able to know that we speak of the things about God that He's revealed about Himself. That that's what we, we want to focus on, what is true. And the psalmist does exactly that. And I love the, the Godwardness of this even. He has remembered. Who? Well, God has remembered His loyal love and His truth. The God who never forgets anything has been been mindful of his committed love and his truthfulness. I love that even when we forget, God always remembers. When we are not mindful of God's faithfulness, we can be sure that God is always mindful of his faithfulness. You may forget that God always keeps His promises. Guess what? God doesn't forget that. You may forget that God loves you with an unbreakable love. Guess what? God will never forget that. And we can hold on to that. And that gives us great cause for worship. You already see this starting to break out to a wider audience. And we don't need to focus on that here because that's what the rest of the song is about. But you see there's the focus of the people of God, verse 3, for the house of Israel... And then it immediately says, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. You know, Israelite worship was never, ever intended to be parochial. It was never intended to be kept to themselves. God's covenant was with His people, but God's intention was for His glory to cover the face of the earth. God's people were intended to be a lighthouse, drawing people to the worship of Yahweh. Canaanites, Amorites, all of them were to see the testimony of Israel's deliverance and salvation 
And the intention would be that those people, likewise created in the likeness and image of God, would worship God. It's a helpful reminder to us that our focus when we worship God can't be completely inward. We have to be mindful that the point of worship is, one of the points of worship is to draw other people into worship. That our worship should be so compelling, our love for God, our savoring of His truth, our enjoyment of and proclamation of His glory is intended to not just be for the in crowd. It's not just to be in our little fellowships, but we, we take that out to a dying world. There's a reminder of that even in this, this psalm. All the ends of the earth have been witnesses to the deliverance of our God. Well, that's, that's some of the motive. We could spend a whole week on just those three verses. But I think you get it. The motive of praise is the content of theological truth. It's, it's towards God and it's for one another. And it's focused on salvation and victory. And it has an audience that's broad and wide so that His acts of deliverance would be witnessed by the extremities of the earth. Let's look at the second part. And I think this song just gets better as it goes. Uh, this middle section, let's call it the melody of praise, verses 4 through 6. The melody of praise. And, and this section, to me, is breathtaking. It's just breathtaking. It's boisterous. It's loud. Let me try to translate it for you. Shout joyfully to Yahweh, all the earth. Burst forth or break out into joyous song and sing praise, to resound, to make music. That's the words he's using there. Verse 5, sing praises, it's a musical term, to Yahweh with the lute. Hebrew is kinor. It's, it's like a little guitarish miniature harp thing, most likely. A uh, lute is an English word from way later. We don't know exactly what kind of instruments the Hebrews used, except there was diversity in them. We know that this one had strings, but... Uh, musicians wear out their instruments, and you can imagine these ones didn't last either 3,000 years later. So whatever it was, this stringed instrument, he uses the word twice. Sing praise to Yahweh with the lute, with the lute, and the voice of melody. It's so funny because in other psalms, it always says with the lute and with the harp. You've seen it in the psalms over and over again. It lists those two instruments. For some reason here, the psalmist isn't concerned for that natural balance. He says, sing with the lute and with the lute. Let's get a lute out here. Let's, let's get another lute out here. It's, it's that kind of boisterousness. I, I mean, you look at Psalm 150. It's that famous song that lists all those musical instruments. It's the one that, that the Christians who have persuasions against musical instruments don't like. And it's very technical. It's, you know, some, some fancy conductor wrote Psalm 150. It has all these instruments and, and sounds listed. Psalm 98 was written by some half-baked musician like me, you know, I, I kind of play the guitar and, and the harmonica when I'm on the range. So he's just using words, just he says twice, shout joyfully, sing praises, shout aloud. He's just repeating himself and he says with the lyre or the lute and then with the lyre or the lute again. I, I love the, the roughness of this. And then he says and with the voice of melody, that's where I got the name for the point, this is melody of praise. This is all musical notation here. And it's, it's boisterous and it's loud. Verse 6, with trumpets. Again, that's an English word. Trumpets weren't invented then. This is probably something more like a bugle uh, used for hunting, used for war, used to say it's time to break up camp. It's, there's invaders coming, used to announce victory. It's some sort of horn, and I'm sure they could uh, figure out how to bend notes with it, but uh, they call it a, a horn. And the voice of the horn, and here's another kind of horn. This is a, you know this one, this is the shofar, the ram's horn that the, the priests would blow. And so the idea here isn't like skillfully composed music necessarily. It's just loud sounds that are intending all to accompany this final phrase of verse 6. Shout aloud before Yahweh, the King. What you have here. It is not just a, a, a pretty song. What you have here is you have a song intended to accompany the coronation of a king. That's what's happening in this middle section. The melody of this praise is breathtaking because it's the coronation. No wonder when Jesus was born that those 
Matthew 2.2, 2, where is he that was born king of, king of the Jews? You know, it was no wonder that kingly gifts were given to him because the Messiah was always intended to be a regal figure. And so in this ancient worship song, composed far before Jesus was ever born, we see that God is identified as He really is, as a coming King, as a King to be acknowledged, a King to be worshipped, a King to be revered and and held up. And and in verses 4-6, through the instruments are invited to join. And then the voices are invited to join. And now they're singing. And, and really our singing, Kidner I think says, that our singing here on earth to God is intended to be a rehearsal for the final coronation of God in heaven. And I think that's right. And I think this, this whole melodious section in this song ought to be convicting for us because when we sing, we way too often think about, well, is it just right? You know, did my voice crack? I'm not a good singer. Uh, you know, I got to kind of be careful. And, you know, it's a, especially when you're in a small church and you can kind of hear everybody. I just will be giving encouragement to you. Y'all, y'all sound great. I love being able to use the plural, y'all. Uh, y'all sound great. And, and the only thing you need to do is sing even louder. That's it. Sing even louder. I think what would surprise us if we attended Israelite worship is how boisterous it was. I think it would be very loud. And I think that God intends us to sing out. John Wesley used to tell his Methodists to sing, quote, lustily and with good courage. I don't know about that, but that's strong. He he went on to say, beware of singing as if you were half dead or asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, no more ashamed of it being heard than when you sang the songs of Satan. Whoa. What always reminds me of this is whenever I go to a concert or to a baseball game. At a concert, you go pay to listen to some famous person sing, and all you hear, mainly, is the people around you sing. And they're bad. There's a reason they didn't get Sony Records, you know? I'm here to hear Taylor Swift, for example. But all I'm hearing is this, these, you know, preteen girls yelling at the top of their lungs, all the lyrics. How much more so do we have something to sing about? I didn't go to Taylor Swift concert. Just let that out right now. Let's go baseball, manlier illustration. Seventh inning stretch comes along. Root, root, root for the Dodgers. And all these drunk bozos at the game are singing at the top of their lungs. How much more so ought we to attend God's praises with melodious singing? Don't worry about how you sound. Know that you're singing at the coronation of a king every time we gather. And it's practice. It's practice for that final choir. It's practice for that ultimate expression of song and joy and voices. It's supposed to be with acclaim, with joy, with melody, with noise. And we do what we do because we know that we sing before Yahweh and to Yahweh and to Yahweh. And we burst forth with joyous song and sing praise with the voice of melody, the voice of the horn. We shout aloud. It's wonderful to sing to God. And if you've been transformed by the gospel, there's really no option. You want to sing. You want to lift your voice. You want to open your mouth. And you want to express to Him the love that you have for all the blessings that attend victory, salvation, and deliverance. That's the melody of praise. Well, finally, and and this is, I, I think every section is the best, but this third section I love. And we'll call it the mission of our praise. It's it's kind of the goal, the direction. That's what I mean by mission. Look what it says. Let the sea thunder. This is the same word. Verse 7, verse 4, and verse 1 all all use the same phrase. So there's parallelism here, beautifully composed. Let the sea thunder or resound and all that fills it. The world and those who dwell in it. So here's the peoples of the world again. The rivers, let them (laughs) clap their hands. Together with the mountains too, shout for joy. 
Verse 9, before Yahweh, because He is coming. And then the tone, I think, changes to our ears to judge the earth. What? He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Candy canes, eggnog, sleigh rides, God's judgment of all the earth. What doesn't belong in a Christmas song? Well, Isaac Watts thought this fit just fine. And he saw in this final note, there, there's at least two things here that I think are, are difficult for us. For me, for sure. I remember, I didn't grow up singing hymns. I went to a, a, a mega church, rock concert kind of church growing up. And when I came to Grace almost 15 years ago, I, I was introduced to hymns. And now I think I know almost all the hymns in the hymnal. And there was something that struck me, though, at first. And it was how many of the, the hymns had this naturalistic language in it, talking about rocks and trees, glades and forests. And I was like, that's so corny. Why is that in there? Why don't we talk about God? And, and I thought I, I knew something until I studied the Psalms more, because the Psalms are full of coastlands and fire and lightning and mountains and seas and river and animals and plants, even deer. Deer. You guys, I killed a really big deer. <laughs> I've never even done this before, and Ford is still mad at me for killing one of his deer. That's a side note. But there is, there's deer in the Psalms. There's, look at, look at this verse, verse 7. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Well, what is that? What fills the sea? Go ahead, tell me. Fish. Be more specific with your feedback. Tuna. Orcas. Kelp. Give me something. Whales. Sharks. Creatures of all kinds. I mean, think about what fills the sea. Those weird fish with the headlamp, the puffer fish, kelp, seaweed, everything at the sushi bar, all of it. It fills the sea. And the psalmist thinks that's good worship. Let the sea roar or resound in all that fills it. Whales, anemones, kelp, tuna, swordfish, coral reefs, sharks, puffer fish, little tiny uh, kind of bacterias and kelp and everything else that's in the ocean, including the water and the sand, and, and all of it is intended to be an ascribing of worship to God. And, and I think we're so, and, and I'm just confessing my own wrong thinking here, I think we're so Neoplatonist, we're so, we're so Gnostic in thinking about spiritual versus physical that sometimes we forget and it takes a sunrise to remind us. We forget that this entire creation was spoken into existence by God. That you and I are, are creatures made by God, just like the, the creatures out in the world. Now we're different because we're made in the likeness and image of God, not like a dog. But dogs are made by God. And all those creatures in the sea are made by God. And, and rivers are made by God. The world and those who dwell in it. The mountains are shouting for joy. This is a present tense call. I mean, I, just get geeky for one second here. Yeah, right. Verses 1 through 3 are all in a, a verbal form called katal in Hebrew. It's like what God has done. But by the time you get to the end of this song, it's in yitol, which is what God will do. It's what God is doing and will do. And so all these natural features of the earth are presented to us as examples of worshipers. The sea is worshiping God. The sky is worshiping God. The earth is worshiping God. And all of it is being called to a further and greater worship. And I want you to get a hold of this because when you read the, the verse here that says, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, it's not just that Isaac Watts was kind of running out of lyrics. Let me just list some plants and stuff. It's that a good biblical understanding of creation is a reminder 
that this world in the flora and fauna is doing a better job of worshiping its creator than we are. Do you get that? Because rivers are doing river things. That's what God intended them to do. The sea is doing sea stuff. Orcas do orca stuff. Deers do deer stuff until I stop them. And all of this created order is doing what it's supposed to do. It's why Jesus told those who had hard hearts to him, if, if they don't worship, the rocks will cry out. Why? Because rocks do rock things. But people, the ones made in God's likeness image, we're the ones in rebellion. And when we fell, Genesis 3.17, God cursed us and He cursed the ground. But the ground didn't turn on God. It turned on us. And so we look at this physical description of creation, doing what it is intended to do, but then with a future look that someday it will do it all the more because God will make it new. When will He do that? Well, verse 9. This is before Yahweh, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. You see, this last section reminds us that rather than trying to be these souls disconnected from the physical, that's what Plato was all about, that we are physical and spiritual creatures, and we walk on a physical world. And this stuff matters. Stuff matters. Matter matters because it matters to God. And when all creation is enjoined to praise God, rather than thinking, well, God's kingdom is not of this world. True. But God's kingdom is certainly for this world. Because He intended to redeem it, to redeem all of it. It's why Psalm 19 reminds us that the whole earth is full of His glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and the words to the end of the world. I mean, that kind of language reminds us that matter matters because it matters to God. The sea is doing sea things and only humans can behave as we are not. He made this world to do this, whether it's the glories of Yosemite or a beautiful Texas sunrise or a plant in your office window. Every single part of this creation is testifying to God's matchless glory. And it's proving that He rules over this world. And it's reminding us that a time will come when He finally rules and makes all things new. His rule is real now, but it will be fully realized when He comes to judge the earth, to judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. God's judgment is not something that we could withstand. Apart from the intervention of Jesus, Him in our place, His death on the cross, forgiveness of our sin, we could not stand the judgment of God. But because Christ has absorbed the wrath of God, we can long for this day of judgment. Not because we dance knowing the wicked will be destroyed, but we know that God will set all things right. And when He does, He does it perfectly. With righteousness, verse 9, and the peoples with equity. What we will see, not this Christmas, but some Christmas, we will see Genesis 3.17, Cursed is the ground because of you, turn into Revelation 21.5, where Jesus says, I am making everything new. Christmas is a reminder that there is a coming joy to this world because of the joy that came when Jesus took on flesh. We cannot think that matter doesn't matter because in the incarnation, Jesus took on skin cells, and bones, and muscles, and blood, and facial hair, and flesh. Matter matters to God so much so that Jesus became a man to show us as human beings how to get to God, how to worship God. 
And as we think about God's coming judgment and His renewal of all things, we're mindful that there is a testimony in creation and a tension in creation. That God will come to destroy the natural world, but He will not leave it undone. He will make it new. Because our destiny is bound up in the destiny of the created order. That's what your, I think you just did in, in the book of Romans, right? That's Romans 8, 19 with the men's study. We watch you all online. Just know you're being watched. Somebody took Romans out of my Bible. Romans 8, look at this. Uh, 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. I mean, that's incredible. To know that the fate of creation and the fate of, of humanity are bound up together. This should cause us to sing joy to the world with a different perspective. No longer only thinking about His first coming, but mindful of His second coming. That we can sing the line, He comes to make His blessings flow as far as the curse is found. To know that when Yahweh comes to reign, the curse will be lifted. And this world and all who follow Jesus will be liberated. And then we will sing. We will sing like we do now, but with true exuberance and true freedom, with the fulfillment of all that reality. And we will say, joy to the world. The King has come. Father, thank You for Your truth. It excites our hearts to think of how wise You are, O oh God. To think of how little we understand Your incredible plan as we see it unfold in our brief sojourn on this earth. May we long for the second advent as we celebrate the first this Christmas. Thank you for these dear saints. Use them for your glory. Use this church to make your name great as we seek to worship you, heart, soul, and mind. In Jesus' name, amen.